begin with a rather unique question this morning, especially for a priest, especially in the church, especially on a Sunday. Have you ever had a hangover? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, I hear that they can be rough. Now, I, I don't have any experience in this, but I hear they're, they're bad at times. You know the story. The night before, you felt alive and you loved everybody. And then the next morning, you wake up with a splitting headache and you can't say for sure, but you might be dead. <laughs> Once in a while, life has these hangover moments. I was in the pharmacy last week and I heard two college-aged young ladies talking about what they termed an emotional hangover. Now, I was just too curious to resist. So I practiced an ancient art form from the seminaries called cultural exegesis. <coughs> In the real world, that has a very different name. It's called eavesdropping. <laughs> and one young woman said to the other, I hate Valentine's Day. And as I listened to her, I quickly learned that there were many things that she hated. I nicknamed her the Decemberist because she never wanted December to end. And then her friend, whom I decided to nickname the Optimist, continued their discourse and she said, and I quote, it makes me sick that the new year isn't even here yet and they're making us put Valentine's Day candy on these shelves. And the romanticist, without missing a beat, she said, yeah, Christmas is gone. And it feels like my New Year's Eve hangover that I haven't had yet is here already. And with that, my attention it drifted off. And I said to myself, this is just too good not to work into a sermon. <laughs> so there you have it. Christmas hangover. Their tirade, though, it did highlight something for me. The days following Christmas are hard. At Christmas, we experience the birth of Jesus, the gifts, the food, the smiles, the laughter, the family feuds, and that secret family recipe of eggnog. And then all of a sudden, it ends. And the Christmas chocolate Santas disappear, and in their stead is Valentine's Day candy at the local pharmacy. In essence, it's a post-Christmas hangover. To me, that's why this gospel reading is so perfectly timed. We find Mary and Joseph caught in this post-Christmas tension. On Christmas, the child was born. They entertained shepherds. Angels sang choruses. And then the scene shifted. For Matthew, it's a 180 degree turn. They go from joy to terror. Joseph dreamed that an angel said to him, Run away to Bethlehem. Herod seeks the child's life because he threatens his power. Take him to Egypt. And as quickly as we can snap our fingers, Christmas was over for Mary and Joseph. That highlights something for me. There are Bethlehem moments of celebration for us. But sometimes we have to leave Bethlehem's manger in life and move past those celebratory moments, those times, those places, those people, even those careers, and follow where God is leading us now. To me, Joseph is the unsung hero of this birth narrative because he models obedience to God. He inspires me because he obeys God in multiple ways. Not simply by doing what he's told, that's not real obedience, that's normally out of fear, but he does so out of trust, and he does so out of a sense of vocation, a sense of call. 
So first, he obeys God by trusting God. When the angel spoke to him, he trusted that message. And he started a long and difficult journey towards Egypt. Now, me, I would have said, uh, Amber, I'm hearing, uh, hearing some voices and some dreams, and I need you to go on healthgrades.com. I need you to find me the highest rated psychiatrist in the panhandle and get me an appointment. But not Joseph. He obeys. It's a long trip to Egypt. I, I decided to do the math and do some research on it, and I realized uh, miraculously, I had a revelation, that they couldn't just hop on a 737 in Bethlehem International and land at Cairo an hour later. It was a 12-day journey on a donkey across the desert where there were thieves, there were threats, there was very little water, and what water did exist, the mineral deposits in the sand rendered it undrinkable. So there's Joseph, Mary, and Jesus on a 12-day journey headed across the desert. It makes me wonder if Joseph grumbled a little bit. Have <laughs> you ever thought of it that way? Did he, did he sit there and kind of ruminate under his breath about how thirsty he was and about how hot it was? And, and how all the water is going to the woman and the kid. I would have. I know you wouldn't. No. But also, I'm sure that he realized that in the act of obeying God, that God was with them. And that God would handle the outcome. Either way, he trusted God. Heading to Egypt, he realized that Christmas was a joyous time of angelic choirs and wise men and miracles. But he also realized that Christmas was a requirement. When the child, Jesus, is born in our hearts, it means more than a manger moment. It also means trusting God and going farther than we thought we would ever go. So Joseph obeyed God by trusting God. He also obeyed God by embracing his vocation. So that word vocation, it literally means a call. And when we hear that, our minds automatically go to the priesthood. Well, people are called to be priests, deacons, and bishops. But a vocation is about a calling for all of us. The Episcopal Church has been working for the last 20 years to restore what we call a baptismal identity. And that is all of the baptized are called to ministry. So if you want to find out what that calling is, ask a few questions. What am I good at? What do I enjoy? And how can I use those things to help the church. See, Joseph, he accepted that his life was more than simply being a carpenter. He accepted caring for the Christ child as a vocation, even when it meant suffering. Think about that. Jesus was the source of hardship for Joseph. People came to the manger, they looked at Jesus, wise men visited, but when it got hard, when the Christmas lights and the tree came down and, and the chocolate Santas disappeared, Joseph didn't put the baby down. He didn't walk away from Jesus. He didn't abandon the child just because his life was hard. He embraced him. He endured the whispers in society for the sake of the boy. He went to Bethlehem, then he went to Egypt, and then he went to Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? All for the sake of a calling that God put on his life. He obeyed God, and he accepted his vocation that was to care for the Christ child. Now, a crisis usually does one of two things. 
It turns us away from Jesus because he's not supposed to let these kinds of things happen. This is just too hard for me. Or a crisis turns us to Jesus. And we can say there is a purpose in this. I do not understand it right now, but I trust that God can transform this into his will. Through it all, Joseph realized that Christmas did reveal the joy of the world, Jesus. But he also realized that Christmas called him to a very different kind of life. One that would be hard. Now, there's a shallow idea that circulates these days. And I think it's so popular because it's so enticing. I've fallen prey to it. Perhaps you have too. It uses God's love against us. It goes something like this. A loving God would never allow bad things to happen to good people. Why would you follow a God who allows such evil in the world? It's an enticing idea. But it falls short of sound philosophical reasoning. Because it makes the world revolve around us. It makes precious little Ryan the center of the whole universe. And my comfort matters above all else. However, if there is a, a creator, one who initiated a big bang moment, then God knows more than we do. And thanks be to God for that. And that God calls us to trust and not get sidetracked by the seduction that God is not loving. We started with a hangover. So let's end with a spiritual homemade Bible remedy. <clears throat> I want to share a poem from my book, if I may, that deals with this. It's titled, When God Got Drunk. God got drunk late one night, so he decided to set things right. The more the wine of love that flowed, the more his love for humanity showed. That love was not as resentful people told. It wasn't conditional, fearful, or cold. He called them round and told them all their view of love was much too small. Sit still and listen to me well. Don't scare people away with your hell. It never was my heart's intent. Sorrow and pain my love to prevent. If wine is love, then may you get drunk and stop believing all of that junk. Amen. Amen.